Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lee Smith. Uh, I'm uh, moderating our panel this afternoon on offshore wind. Uh, I've uh, been associated with the Climate Jobs New York and the Climate Jobs National Resource Center for the, the last few years. I'm senior policy advisor. Uh, I'm also um, run a solar power company. I've been in the renewable energy business for about 15 years, and but I'm relatively new to offshore wind, having gone through uh, the memorable experience of touring the Danish offshore wind industry a few years ago with a contingent of people from uh, Climate Jobs New York. So we have a terrific panel today. Um, Mariah uh, Degnan, who is our staff person for Climate Jobs New York on Long Island for our offshore wind, is going to be working, uh, assisting on the panel discussion and has a few housekeeping points to make to everybody. Mariah, you want to explain how they can ask questions? Yes, thanks, Lee. Hi, everyone. I want to remind you that we'll be using Slido to ask questions during the panel. So please scan the QR code on your screen or type in our event number, 538 346 on slido.com. Again, 538 346 on slido.com. We're looking forward to it. So when you uh, when questions arise, you know, jot them down, put them on Slido. Uh, Mariah's going to be going through them. And then when we get to that part of the program where we're going to have uh, questions from the audience, uh, she'll be reading off uh, some of the more pertinent questions. Uh, we have, um, excuse me, we have, um, a as I said, we have a terrific panel. Uh, our first speaker is, is Amanda Lefton, who is the person for the Department of Interior, runs an agency called BOEM, which you know, some of you may have heard of, as involved in providing the, the leasing uh, for offshore wind development. Uh, our, our second panelist is Eric Hines, who runs a program at Tufts University studying uh, not only offshore wind, but other aspects of energy infrastructure. Um, has covered a lot of the different aspects of this, thinking about it. We have uh, Haylin Cho from the Communication Workers, who is very involved in the supply chain issues, uh, as they represent the workers at the Schenectady New York plant of uh, General Electric, where some components could be made. Um, we have uh, Grant Provost from uh, Iron Workers Local 7 up in Maine, where they're developing some exciting floating offshore wind technology. Uh, we also have David Langless from uh, the Iron Workers Local 37 out of Rhode Island, which is already deeply involved in the practical aspects of this because of the Vinland or Vineland uh, development. And then lastly, we have uh, Doreen Harris, who runs a state agency in New York called NYSERDA. Uh, NYSERDA has been playing a critical role in the development of the offshore wind industry in New York, having um, signed a contract with Equinor for the first development and has come up with a, a plan for uh, about nine gigawatts of offshore wind development over the next period of time. So uh, we have people who can cover uh, the development side, uh, the, the labor side, and some of the, the big picture uh, questions as well. It's a very appropriate time for us to have this kind of discussion because we're, we're right on the cusp of um, the launch of what's potentially going to be a, an enormous new energy infrastructure, and I think it's important for people to realize that um, offshore wind is a energy infrastructure process. It involves uh, huge investments, complicated projects, and it also involves a direct role for government in a couple of different ways, and it has a supply chain aspect that is uh, critical to the development of the industry. So. We're at the stage now where we're, we're looking forward to uh, potentially enormous development 
of, of a resource that is located very close to the demand and has a lot of uh, technical and economic advantages and it benefits from market forces that are bringing costs down and the demand for renewable energy is, con is, is going to continue to increase as people uh, experience the effects of climate change. So we're right at the beginning of it and the kinds of issues that we talk about today are going to be critical in shaping the way this industry develops and whether we reach the full potential that geography has given us in terms of the ability to site offshore wind. So uh, I'm excited to, to do that and I think to uh, start the process of, of understanding uh, it's important to understand the role the federal government plays in this uh, because without them uh, we wouldn't have uh, the development of offshore wind and so I'm very pleased to have uh, Amanda Lefton, who's the director of the Bureau of um, Ocean and Energy Management, uh, who's going to explain to us the, the new Biden administration approach to offshore wind and what that portends. Amanda? Well, great. Thank you so much for that, that wonderful introduction to this incredible panel with so many great people on it. It's, it's really good to be here today. And uh, while I am normally based in D.C., actually uh, calling in today from upstate New York, uh, from Troy, New York, and, and happy to, to be here as we talk about uh, the important opportunity of climate jobs and what this could mean for New York and the nation. Um, so as, as mentioned, I'm the director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, I'm going to call it BOEM, and we're a sub-agency in the Department of the Interior, and beh on behalf of the Department of the Interior and Secretary Holland, uh, I'm grateful to be here today to talk about offshore wind, a critical priority for hers and for the president. And um, a little bit about BOEM. BOEM is uh, the federal agency within the interior tasked with managing energy and mineral resource development on the outer continental shelf, where the OCS, that's where offshore wind is primarily going to happen. And our responsibilities include managing conventional and renewable energy resources, as well as OCS sand and gravel, which are used for things like coastal protection and restoration projects. And of course, we're the lead regulatory agency on offshore wind. Here at BOEM, all of our work is guided by rigorous science and knowledge-based environmental review and analysis. A little bit about our vision at BOEM and our mission on offshore wind. First, we are driven by the need to act on climate. Climate change is already impacting families across the country and we must transition to a clean energy future equitably. And we know that offshore wind can play a critical role in meeting the country's energy needs. Two, just as the president says, when we think about climate, we think about jobs. And offshore wind can create thousands of good paying union jobs and a robust supply chain in the United States that can ensure people in our country can support their families prepare for their future, and retire with dignity. Third, we need to develop offshore wind responsibly. As I said, we rely on knowledge and science to inform our decisions to avoid impacts to ocean users and the marine environment, and while protecting, while providing economic opportunities for communities who have been left behind or historically marginalized. Fourth, we need to ro robustly engage tribal nations and ocean users like the commercial fishing industry. And finally, we need a smart and transparent process that will provide greater certainty to the industry and stakeholders alike. As we do this, the administration uh, led by, by the, the, the great uh, folks we have in office and, uh, and Secretary Halland is taking an all of government approach towards its ambitious renewable energy goals. And doing this will combat the effect of climate change, create jobs to support families, boost local economies, and help address environmental injustice. Earlier this year, in the spring, the Department of the Interior, along with the Departments of Commerce and Energy, came together to set an administration-wide goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. This will create nearly 80,000 jobs. 
And here at Boehm, we're playing a critical role in implementing the administration's strategy to transition to a clean energy future. Some activities to date include leasing more than 1.7 million acres on the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf for offshore wind. We currently have 18 commercial leases in the Atlantic. We plan to complete the review of at least 16 construction and operation plans by 2025, and those alone represent more than 19 gigawatts of new clean energy for the nation. We're also advancing new lease areas at the Atlantic and the Pacific, and even exploring the Gulf of Mexico. Under this administration, Boehm has made significant progress on all fronts. In May, the Department of the Interior and Boehm took a historic first step and approved the Vineyard Wind Project, which is the first commercial offshore wind project that will be built by union labor in the United States. So we'll have the first ever commercial scale project in the Outer Continental Shelf that will be built by union labor. We've also advanced the proposed sale notice for the New York Bite, which included a new provision for the first time for project labor agreements and increased engagement with ocean users like the commercial fishing industry. Also in May, the Department of the Interior and the Department of Defense and the state of California announced an agreement to advance areas for offshore wind off California's northern and central coasts, which will be the first time that we will see uh, new lease areas in the Pacific. So we are expanding from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And in July, we sought feedback from the regional Carolina Long Bay Task Force to explore a potential lease sale uh, later next year. Last month, we published a final environmental impact statement for South Fork, a project contracted with New York in the waters offshore Rhode Island. And we've advanced seven projects towards environmental review in the last seven months, with more expected to come later this year. We expect to hold lease sales for the New York Bight early next year and for offshore California and North Carolina in 2022. And we've begun exploring opportunities in the Gulf of Mexico, which uh, broadly is a mature industrial base and has a long history of offshore energy development. The region's oil and gas industry has the ability and experience to play an integral role in the nation's transition to clean energy as we can help transition communities. Boehmus has also committed to growing offshore wind to reap the benefits of clean energy and job creation, particularly in underserved communities. And I just talked a lot about some of the, the great progress we've made to date. Uh, and the reason being is because all of that progress that I just spoke about in, in just the last seven or eight months of this administration truly demonstrate a sea change for offshore winds in the United States that will uh, ensure that we are getting the investments in the supply chain to create good paying jobs and allow us to truly transition to offshore wind uh, and, and achieve the administration's goals. So I look forward to a further discussion with the rest of my panel members over the next hour. Back to you, Lee. How do you like that? Okay, so I'm no longer on mute. Uh, Amanda, thank you very much for uh, that uh, overview of what the, the federal government You've gotten off to a fast start, um, and, th and that's encouraging. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of thorny issues and questions, and we'll try to get into some of them later. Um, next, I'd like to ask uh, Eric Hines from uh, Tufts University, who's been studying this issue um, and has some uh, interesting observations on both the U.S. and the global offshore wind industry. Eric? Thank you, Lee, and thank you everyone here for the invitation to participate on this esteemed panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I am sharing a few slides. Uh, can I get confirmation that those are visible? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So, just to step back, yes, Lee? Yeah, the slides are visible. Excellent. Okay. 
Uh, so Lee asked me to share some uh, perspective, sort of from a global perspective, and to zoom out a little bit and talk about what we're in the middle of. And I think you've just heard from Director Lefton uh, the incredible things and the pace at which the United States is pursuing offshore wind right now. And we're really in an important historic moment. I think it's important to recognize that the resource we're dealing with is a vast resource. Uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, put out a report just a couple of years ago, uh, about two years ago, saying that there's enough offshore wind in the world to power the entire world 11 times over in 2040. And that's just from the area of what you see here on this slide. Another indicator of the historic moment that we're in is that in a period of about five years, uh, offshore wind turbines themselves grew by a factor of three and the price came down by a factor of three. Things changing that much that quickly are virtually unheard of in our lifetimes. And we're in a very particular inflection point. And I think that it's something that a lot of us who are close to the industry take heart in and really can begin to take seriously uh, that we have a fighting chance to beat climate change with what's going on right now. To emphasize this point further, more than a factor of three offshore wind state commitments, these are state commitments to purchase offshore wind up and down the East Coast, have grown by a factor of 20. That's over an order of magnitude within a period of five years as well. And I can, I can tell you that in 2016, just after Massachusetts passed its legislation for 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind, I don't think anybody at the time was guessing that we would be at 40,000 megawatts of commitments by 2040. North Carolina just having been the latest state to put uh, eight gigawatts on the table in terms of a commitment. This is very exciting. It's very exciting to watch the Biden-Harris administration so clearly articulate a goal of 30 gigawatts by 2030. Uh, that is a realistic goal. It is also an ambitious goal, and it is a goal that as we meet that goal, we will be preparing ourselves for the work ahead. And my best estimates for all of this, uh, having sort of looked at things, you know, from a bunch of different points of view, are that we need uh, 300 gigawatts by 2050 of offshore wind on the East Coast alone. And a lot of the reports in our pathways to 2050 right now are also saying that we're going to need 3,000 gigawatts of wind and solar power, that's including offshore land-based, to power the United States by 2050. You want to multiply that by approximately 10 again, and you can get the entire world. And so I think the point here is that while we're starting in our home territory, while we're trying to learn, there's a lot of learning we have to do. We build these early projects. If we do this right, the United States is gonna be able to participate in a global marketplace that is gonna be larger than anything I think we have sort of thought of up to this point. The project that we're embarking on is singularly ambitious uh, and can do a lot of good. At Tufts, we like to talk about the parts of offshore wind that the market really doesn't take care of on its own, the parts of offshore wind where it's uh, critical that the public sector, the private sector, and we would argue the academic sector all have to work together in order to figure out a uh, viable and, um, and correct path forward so that we can really take on this, uh, this incredible challenge that we have. And so we like to talk about infrastructure, uh, supply chain and transmission, all of these also require thinking about the long game. They require thinking about beyond a project by project approach, and they require thinking about numbers that are on the orders of magnitude of what I just showed. A little bit of background for me, I came into offshore wind out of infrastructure and in earthquake engineering and a lot of what's going on on the East Coast right now reminds me of what was happening on the West Coast when I was doing my graduate studies. This is a picture of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge East Bay spans. And this bridge was designed for 150 year design life and for a 1500 year earthquake, a magnitude eight on the San Andreas Fault. On the right hand side, you see a test of one of the piers shown on the left here, one of the bridge piers here. This is a 25% scale model. Uh, and this uh, has to be done to demonstrate, we have to test this to demonstrate that the bridge can actually survive. We did the same thing in offshore wind. We built the Wind Technology Testing Center starting in 2008, that was completed in 2011. There is a need for large scale demonstration and testing to really understand that what we're designing can last um, the 25 years that it's designed to last, but then can also, it needs to be designed to last 50 to 100 years. We need to be thinking about this as infrastructure and not just as machines that you take off the shelf and install in the ocean. These are the biggest machines in the world. 
And this is serious business installing these. Once they're up, we're going to want to keep them, just like we've kept the Hoover Dam. As far as I know, no one's planning on tearing that thing down anytime soon. It's 85 years old. It still has the original turbines and the original bearings from the original construction. And this is the era that we're in right now. Uh, we are, People talk about the Green New Deal, and we are indeed in the middle of a brand new era uh, where what we're taking on is as ambitious, if not more ambitious, than what we had to do in the 1930s and the 1940s. So I'm going to leave everyone with a final thought, a uh, comparison of Europe and the United States. Europe is about 30 years more advanced than we are in offshore wind. The United States has a lot to bring to the table. Uh, it's actually understandable when you look at these two maps, they are to scale. If you go onto Google Earth and you go to Europe and the North Sea and then you scroll over and look at the United States, the East Coast doesn't look quite as big as I had originally thought it was before I created this diagram. The North Sea is really a, a, a significant size. It has shallow water. It has a sandy bottom. It has countries surrounding it that make it a very compelling electrical network and it has an existing oil and gas industry. The United States, we have different challenges. And my point here is that we need to think about this on our own terms, and we need to understand this in terms of our own geography, our own workforce, and what we're thinking of. We have uh, very good shallow water in the outer continental shelf, but then we get into deep water rather quickly, which is why we're leaders in floating offshore wind. All of our resources on one side of the coast, that all has to cross a line here. We do not have an oil and gas industry in the Northeast. We have a recreation industry, a tourism industry, and a fishing industry. When you think about the Jersey Shore and Long Island, and you think about Cape Cod. So this is a very different sort of cultural meeting of the minds happening. We have North, the North Atlantic right whale, and we, have, uh, and we have significant hurricanes. And so the opportunity is ours to take our destiny into our own hands, uh, to work together. I'm very excited about what's going on at the federal government level and through all the states right now. The level of cooperation, the level of collaboration and people rolling up their sleeves is something I don't think anybody could have imagined 10 years ago when we were thinking about this. So again, thank you for having me on the panel, Lee. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, Eric, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it, we went to, I mentioned earlier that we had taken a, a tour of the offshore wind industry in Denmark, which is one of the center centers of offshore wind uh, in the North Sea, and the process that they went through over a, almost a 20-year period to get to the point they're in now. So we're, we're at the early stages here. Um, one of the key parts of this is going to be the development of the uh, components uh, manufacturing of the, of the components and to talk a little bit about that um, from a um, um, union point of view and um, from a New York point of view uh, Halen from the CWA is going to talk a little bit about their plans and the activities that uh, they, they, the campaigns they've started to capture some of this component manufacturing Great. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Halen Choi. I'm the state legislative and political director for CW District 1. Uh, very happy uh, to be here today on this really exciting panel uh, during Climate Week, uh, talking about all the um, really impressive progress um, we're seeing. So, Quick word about CWA. CWA District 1 represents over 65,000 workers in New York State who work in telecommunications, healthcare, the public sector, and many other industries. And as members, our members and the communities deal with the impact of climate change every day. We also have a manufacturing division, uh, IUE CWA, that represents thousands of workers at Gen General Electric, GE, across the country in a variety of industries, including power generation. Our unions and our members are deeply invested in GE's revival as a leading domestic manufacturer. And I like to stress domestic because that's one of the problems that we're seeing with uh, GE. GE was once an iconic leader in domestic manufacturing and now they have a choice to make. They can continue 40 years, uh, it's 40 years track record of disinvesting, de-unionizing and offshoring its US manufacturing operations, or they can be part of this exciting progress that we're seeing, recommit to investing in the US, uh, recommit to manufacturing in the US, help our nation to build back better and create green jobs for a green economy. 
So we launched a campaign with the motto, bring it home GE, to bring GE to the table as a serious partner, ready to invest in the future of American manufacturing and invest in green jobs. As part of the campaign, we have made some exciting progress here in New York, and I'm uh, happy to talk about that here today. Our campaign has two main goals. Number one, grow union jobs in the U.S. Number two, grow a domestic supply chain for the green energy economy. So what's happening in New York? New York State, um, as Lee mentioned, is in the process of launching the largest offshore wind production project in the country. A Norwegian company, uh, Lee, I think you mentioned it, named Equinor has been selected to provide uh, the state with offshore wind power. And now Equinor is preparing to select its supplier for wind turbines. Uh, among considerations are several companies. And obviously, uh, we really think GE is in a good position and our members are ready Um to be selected to produce uh, the turbines for the wind sites. So um, as part of the progress that we're seeing and really high standards that we're seeing um, as part of this development, this year's state budget included important incentives to source wind turbine manufacturing in state. And that will enable New York State to leverage its investment to jumpstart an in-state green ma manufacturing supply chain. Um, GE's electric turbine facility in Schenectady, once called Electric City, has shrunk from 30,000 workers to 800 workers over the past 30 years, with many of the jobs being shipped overseas, most recently to Poland. And by harnessing the power of wind, we can put laid off manufacturing workers in our own communities back to work. We can build a green future that ends its, the dangerous impacts of outsourcing our essential infrastructure. And in New York and GE uh, really have an opportunity here. And our workers are ready to be a leader uh, in the wind energy supply chain. Our members have the expertise and the skills that would translate easily to the production of components in offshore wind. And as Schenectady workers currently build large scale turbines that are used to, the pow to power the electric grid And this skill set, we believe, is very closely aligned with what is needed to build wind turbine nacelles. We believe it's essential to set the state uh, for the offshore wind industry to be high road, create, creating incentives for sourcing production into existing union represented facilities uh, is one very important part of a high road best value approach. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity to expand the focus on the whole supply chain. Not only should the construction of wind energy projects should be done with union labor, but also the operation, the maintenance, and the production of the components. As folks have stressed here on this panel, we have a huge opportunity here. Offshore wind is huge potential. I love the slides uh, that you just showed, Eric. Um, and there's tremendous potential, there's tremendous demand, but unless we believe, unless we're able to really cover the whole supply chain, we won't be able to really take advantage of this opportunity, which by the way, other countries are actively already doing by negotiating that components um, are manufactured in their respective countries. So the global demand is only going to rise and we have a chance to be a big player to truly deliver a win, 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 a win for the climate, a win for good union jobs, and a win for communities that have been devastated by neoliberal deindustrialization. So we're honored to, part, uh, to partner in this campaign with Climate Jobs New York, uh, the Blue Green Alliance, Greenpeace, the Labor Network for Sustainability, and the Sierra Club. And uh, if I can make a quick plug, you can learn all about this wonderful campaign at greenjobsgreeneconomy.org. Thanks for having me here today and ex excited to join the discussion. Okay, hey Lynn, that was great. If you, um, later on, I want to talk a little bit about the, your ideas on the kinds of things that you would like to see Bohm and uh, NYSERDA do to, su to support this effort to uh, get component manufacturing. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, next, uh, we're, we're going to have uh, Grant, Provost, Uh, from the iron workers uh, in Maine, uh, talk about their experience. Uh, the conditions in Maine are quite a bit different than what we have uh, off of Long Island, and um, it's going to require some different technology. So it's a, a, a little diversity in terms of the approaches. So, uh, Grant, could you share some of your 
insights and experience with us. Absolutely. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be on such a great panel. As Lee mentioned, my name is Grant Provost. I'm the business agent for Iron Workers Local 7 in the state of Maine. I'm also a Maine State AFL-CIO executive board member, as well as three state Maine workforce boards. I sit on the Climate Jobs Resource Center Advisory Committee and the Maine Offshore Wind Roadmap Advisory Committee. It's, it's really great to be participating today. So uh, in Maine, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on climate change. Mostly I've been on the offshore wind side of things. Uh, Maine, we, we're not uh, going to benefit as greatly up from a continental shelf as the rest of the states do. Uh, our offshore wind project is going to be floating. And uh, through the University of Maine, uh, Habib Dagger and Jake Ward, they got an amazing team down there. Um, they've designed a floating hull. The floating hull can be used with mostly local materials, so you don't have to bring components from far away. Uh, and it can be built using existing skill sets. The, uh, the hulls are going to be made from concrete and reinforcing rebar, some post-tensioning. They can also be built in harbor. And since they're floating, uh, the design, you can build them on, a, on, on a barges put together. You can submerge the, bar, submerge the barges, and then you can move them to wherever you need to in the sea, where the existing infrastructure, the cable, um, the, can connect to the substation on land. We're, uh, we're definitely excited to be such a, a part of such great groundbreaking technology, the, the first concrete floating hull in, in the world. Um, for a long time, I've been on different project labor agreements and different projects throughout the Northeast where a fossil fuel company has no problem coming to the area and signing a project labor agreement. It was great to work with a uh, developer that was interested in doing that. And uh, we are able to work with them from the very beginning to get the bill through uh, LD336. LD336 was the uh, PPA purchase power purchase agreement for the project. And because we had an awesome legislator working with us, Mark Lawrence, we were able to get that over the finish line uh, with a PLA amendment. We're excited to uh, get going on construction on that. Hopefully the first one should begin here in the spring of 22 and the research array will begin in 2025 for 12 turbines offshore about 40 miles. Um, I'm going to speak to uh, the fact that of the just transition again, which is a big one. Uh, there's a few fossil fuel power plants within the region that will be shut down, hopefully because of offshore wind and its growth. And it's important for us to, to look at those situations in those plants. We have a unionized workforce where People are getting, you know, they have great pay, they have union benefits, good good retirement. We want to be able to transition them into a new green infrastructure. And, uh, you know, that'll be one of the most important things that offshore wind can bring to the United States, I think, the, the chance to, to leave behind a certain technology, but not to leave behind uh, the good paying jobs that come with it. Um, I appreciate being here and, and I look forward to any questions that this panel has. Thank you, Lee. Okay. All right. Th thank you very much. And and now, um, also from the iron workers, but from um, a different perspective, based upon uh, the experience um, in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, with the with the vineyard, uh, we we have uh, David Langlais uh, from uh, Local Thirty Seven. Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today with everyone. Um, you know, it's exciting uh, to come from the state of Rhode Island, as uh, most people, uh, I would realize, uh, would think, know that Rhode Island is home to America's first offshore wind farm, uh, the Black Island Wind Farm, is something we're extremely proud of. Uh, that project was was built uh, utilizing uh, a project labor agreement, uh, and it, it created over 300 jobs for uh, men and women in the building trades, and it was just a great experience uh, to be involved with that. Additionally, you know, you know Rhode Island's position uh, in, a, in, a, in an area where there are seven to eight uh, offshore projects right up the coast of Rhode Island, some of these are mass, which will create an uh, uh, untold amount of jobs for men and women in this area. Uh, in addition, speaking for the iron workers themselves, uh, um, we, are, we are fortunate to have part of our jurisdictional area, southeastern mass, which uh, covers the vineyard wind area uh, for that project. That project was, uh, PLA was just signed uh, uh, for that about a month or so ago. As you said earlier, it is the first commercial scale uh, project. 
Um, uh, it's kickoff for some of the uh, Fort Worth should start the uh, summer of 2022. Uh, so we're extremely excited for that. And, um, you know, to get, getting prepared for that, we've been sending uh, members uh, for, you know, for additional trainings to be ready for uh, for doing some of that. If, if some of that comes up later on in the discussion, I'd be happy to share exactly what we're doing for that training. Um, like I said, if you look at this area, seven or eight uh, projects right off the coast of Rhode Island and Southeastern Mass, an, addi an additional uh, probably eight or ten going down the East Coast. We're really situated here in the Northeast and a, a really uh, uh, a great spot to, to really, have, when this offshore wind industry really kicks off, you know, strong uh, to have, uh, you know, have, have the benefit of this, uh, of this new industry. But really appreciate having the opportunity to be here today. Okay, David, thank you. Have you um, got a training plan in place for the vineyard project? So one of one of the things uh, Vineyard had conveyed from the beginning was that the, the biggest thing uh, for the construction aspect was the uh, uh, sea survival GWO training. You know, we don't in, in, when we were doing Block Island. One of the, one of the things about that project was. No one really knew what we were going to have to do for training. So we just, we just, the IA work, when I say we, and other trades, electricians uh, that were going to be offshore, we just went ahead and did the STCW training, which is basically the Coast Guard Sea Survival Training, which is very similar to uh, the GWO. And I think rather than, you know, the fact that we're having these European developers that are coming over here doing these projects, clearly they're, they're comfortable and familiar with GWO. I think that's probably going to be the standard, at least for sea survival. But that uh, that is one of the uh, and Vineyard had conveyed to us that both in port operations as well as out the sea operations, that training will be needed for those jobs. So, uh, so the trades have been starting to run our members through that training in, in anticipation of this work starting. And and do you anticipate that iron workers will be uh, working onshore or? Offshore or both? So in our project labor agreement, it specifies uh, both uh, port work and offshore work. Okay. One of the one of the uh, which I think is important, especially as these projects uh, start to get negotiated for the PLA. You know, I think the majority of the work is really in port, as far as long as the transition pieces that come from Europe. Uh, that they're not already fitted out with all the exterior platforms, laterways, um, electrical uh, conduits, because we we generated a, a tremendous amount of hours in port on Block Island because all those pieces were separate. Those were all in port and then fitted into the transition pieces uh, of those tubes. And um, my understanding, unfortunately, for Vineyard is those transition pieces are coming over here um, fitted out, so there will be a less hours available in port as there was uh, during uh, uh, Block Island. So I, but I think it's important for any any uh, building tree uh, that's going to enter into the PLA agreements to specify both onshore and offshore work opportunities for the members. Okay, good. So um, our final speaker, um, uh, Doreen Harris, who uh, runs the state agency uh, NYSERDA that has been at the uh, uh, leading the charge in many respects on the development of offshore wind. Uh, we've worked closely with Doreen and some of her staff uh, successfully developing the project labor agreement for the first big project and looking forward to working with her more as this goes forward and also working with her on some of the uh, supply chain and component uh, aspects. So, um, Doreen, can you can you give us a, an idea of what we can expect uh, from NYSERDA over the next couple of years? Sure, of course, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be on this panel and, and certainly learning a lot um, with the discussion thus far. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity. So I am Doreen Harris, the president and CEO of NYSERDA. I've been working on offshore wind development for for a good long time and it's exciting to see where we are today with respect to not only the projects themselves, 
and the planning associated with them, but also, as you indicated, um, we really, some of the, I'll call it the knock-on effects of, of these investments um, becoming manifest. So New York does have the largest goal for offshore wind in the nation um, as codified under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which set forth a number of clean energy goals for the state um, and also a very direct requirement that the benefits of these investments would go in, in a significant amount to disadvantaged communities um, of at least 35% with a goal of 40%. So there's, there's good alignment between New York state policy and, and certainly the federal government in, in many respects. And that's really good news as we move forward in this new administration. And certainly here in New York, under Governor Hochul's leadership, we are taking very seriously the achievement of our goals. I would say that the 2020s, this, this decade that we're in uh, nationally will be looked at as the decade in which we have massively ramped up renewable energy supply. I know New York is, is certainly doing so very assertively, um, not only to meet our strong climate ambitions head on, but also it, with respect to the step changes that we can see with with generation, in this case, like offshore wind, where we can really bring forth real projects, not goals to put the state um, in tandem onto the most ambitious renewable energy trajectory um, that we can imagine. And so to that end, um, New York now has five offshore wind projects in active development. This is, is an incredible pipeline representing nearly 50% of the capacity needed to reach our goal. And we're only just getting started. Um, we certainly are looking at offshore wind development holistically. And what that means for us is, is of course, we want the absolute best projects moving forward. Some of the points made by BOEM Director Lefton are, are exactly the same points that we would make, which is that we really want these projects to be developed in a manner that's responsible and that can be reflective of the input um, and, and active engagement with, with many ocean users and beyond. But also it is true that these investments can and are a huge economic engine on behalf of a state like New York, not only in uh, local economic development opportunities, but also infrastructure investment um, as part of the supply chain needs that we see emerging across the state and, and beyond. Again, manufacturing, construction, maritime and port operations are all part of this equation for us. And critically, in offshore wind, we see a tremendous opportunity to align these goals and this, what I would say, is a generational opportunity with an opportunity to transform our infrastructure and our workforce. So fundamentally, to promote equity and a just transition to this new economy. And, and to do so, we've, we at NYSERDA are, are in the driver's seat in a large degree because of the fact that we are the entity in New York, not only advancing offshore wind, but also signing the power purchase agreements that will bring these projects to fruition. And in doing so, I think we've set a mark um, for other states and beyond to really think about these projects in just that light. So we have demonstrated our commitment to ensuring that these projects themselves create quality and family sustaining jobs for New Yorkers. Um, our awarded contracts include prevailing wage provisions and um, specifically a requirement to negotiate project labor agreements for construction related activities. And that is a framework that we see manifest in, in multiple respects um, up and down the East Coast, which is, which is good news. And our legislature is right on board as well. Um, we, are, we are working now to advance provisions in our 2021 executive budget that look at these issues um, beyond um, what we're already doing to develop um, not only minority and women-owned business requirements, um, to look at Buy American provisions, and beyond, again, these, these investments in a holistic manner. And we do see that supply chain activity ramping up. It's great to hear the feedback of, of those on the panel in this respect. We ourselves have been directly involved in investments in five different ports uh, that are going to be serving this industry from a manufacturing, installation, and O&M um, basis. But what I'm 
extra pleased to see, if that's even possible, is really those investments spreading um, beyond those those seeds that we have planted with our own um, work to deeper parts of the supply chain, New York companies that may even be in Western New York uh, being able to serve this industry and beyond. So I always call off Sherwin the game changer. Um, what's exciting to me is to really see that change manifest here um, across our state and broadly in, in so many different ways. So I'll leave it at that with my thanks for the opportunity. Okay, Doreen, th- thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to assert my privilege as the uh, moderator of the panel to uh, uh, ask um, um, Doreen uh, um, and, and Amanda a couple of uh, leading questions here. Um, and that really relates to the question of the manufacturers who are going to supply the major components uh, for the offshore wind industry. One of the things we learned when we took our um, Cl- Climate Jobs New York tour of the Danish wind industry was that they had a conscious policy of getting their companies, their private companies, uh, Vestas and others uh, directly engaged and linked the development to the sourcing of manufacturing jobs in Denmark. I mean, for them, it was part of a whole industrial strategy to transition from shipbuilding to offshore wind building. So my question um, is, where are you in terms of your thinking about dealing with the manufacturers, not the, not the offshore wind developers, who you already have an direct access to by virtue of letting contracts, but where are you in terms of your thinking about getting people like GE and others um, to build their facilities, to build the manufacturing capacity in the U.S. with an eye towards the fact that this could become not 30 megawatts, not 60 megawatts or gigawatts, but 100 gigawatts, or even, as Eric mentioned, 300. So I'm interested in how you think about getting those big manufacturers into the game. And I'll direct that first to uh, Amanda and then to Doreen. Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's appropriate, I suppose, to have a procurement entity and a regulatory entity both answer that question because I think, I think first to sort of, you know, you, you're talking about uh, the experience of other countries, which is really important. And, you know, notably here in the United States, the, the structure for these processes is different because uh, in the example you're talking about, it was both the regulator and the procurement entity were one. Uh, but here, the way that, that this, this process has unfolded in the United States is you have a state such as the state of New York, which is a procurement entity, and then BOEM as the regulatory entity. So it's, a, it's, a, it's bifurcated in some ways. Uh, so I do want to provide that because I, that, that will allow Doreen and I perhaps to, to bounce off of, uh, of each other for, for the different roles uh, that different entities play in this process. First, I, I think it's really important to note that because of the great progress that has been made by by states like New York with their incredibly ambitious goal in law, um, as well as the many states that are still up on this map here with the ambitious uh, goals that they have put into place, that there is a there is a demand. Um, and now with this administration, Boehm has created more certainty in the process and has begun moving projects through. And creating this pipeline of projects is so important because it's essentially sending the message that we're serious, offshore wind is happening, and it's creating certainty to ensure that we're going to see those investments in the supply chain. And we're already seeing it. We're just to name a few examples, we're seeing, you know, the development of an offshore wind turbine foundation manufacturing facility in Maryland, which is going to be a steelworkers facility. We're seeing a commitment for two offshore wind developers to use a a terminal as a staging area and deploy base for projects offshore Massachusetts. So we're seeing the port infrastructure that's happening. We're seeing a a new manufacturing facility being built in New Jersey to supply monopiles. Uh, 
the first uh, Jones Act compliant offshore wind installation vessels being built in Texas with 14,000 tons of domestic steel from Alabama and West Virginia suppliers. We're seeing the construction of a foundation manufacturing facility in Rhode Island and the construction of the first U.S. offshore wind towers and transition piece manufacturing facility in New York. Uh, excitingly, in in, uh, in the capital region as well, near that Schenectady facility, and the construction of the first U.S. offshore wind substation in Texas. So we're seeing these investments in the United States happen already, just with the 42 megawatts of installed capacity that we have on our road to 30 gigawatts by 2030. So, you know, I think one, probably most importantly, is we need to stay focused on creating this pipeline so that we can get these investments. Further, at BOEM, um, we released the, the New York Bite proposed notice of sale, which includes a, a new lease stipulation for the very first time that's going to ensure that these projects are built to labor. So I know we're talking supply chain, but really important to note that BOEM is now exploring. And while the comment period has closed, as we move forward with the New York Bite, uh, there is this new opportunity for a lease stipulation to require that developers make every effort to establish a project labor agreement, which I think is critically important and we're really excited to uh, advance that for consideration in the final notice of sale. Um, so I'll to say, from our perspective, we need to create this pipeline of projects. We need to ensure that we have a market for investment for the supply chain in the United States uh, and utilize to the extent we can the leasing instrument to ensure that we are putting our best foot forward on, uh, on uh, incorporating critical administration priorities like union built projects. And Doreen, do you wanna talk about the great opportunities in the procurement process on your end? Sure, thanks Amanda. Um, so from our side, certainly the, the, as I said, the fact that we are the procurement entity on behalf of the state of New York means that we are able to express preferences as to what pre types of projects we're looking for. And that is not to say it is absolutely true that that our contracts are not with the likes of GE or Vestas or Siemens Gamesa. Our contracts are with the likes of Ersted or Equinor or et cetera, um, which means that really what we need to allow to develop is this connectivity between the developer and the supplier. And, and that is exactly what we have built into our agreements, um, not only as I said, very significant investments by the state in the infrastructure needed to realize these investments, um, but also requirements um, that, that help make them happen. So we evaluate projects on the basis of the economic development that they will bring to the state of New York, and that is a contract requirement with firm sticks, uh, so to speak. But it also is the case that when we um, look at these projects, we, we also very strongly motivate the developers to, to do more. And, and there's different approaches taken um, by, by states in this respect. I think it is true that the states that Amanda referenced, those activities are happening for various reasons. Of course, the pipeline is a critical one and probably the most critical linchpin. But it also is the case that the investments um, by other parties, whether it be federal, state, local, private, um, all come together in packages that, that are necessary to really realize these investments. I mean, we're not talking about tens of millions of dollars in many instances. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that really need to be leveraged. And therefore, it is often the case that these are packages that are worked by many parties together in a manner to realize the outcome we seek. So in New York State, it is a combination of, of, of course, NYSERDA um, through the governor's leadership, but our economic development agency, the local IDAs, um, certainly our leverage with the private market, and, um, and of course beyond that really are necessary to realize this future. And we are, we're seeing it. And, and I would say some would say we're seeing it sooner than we might have thought, but very appropriate given the magnitude of the commitments that we collectively are making. Okay. Um, Eric, did you want to, uh, do you have any comments on this supply chain development issue? 
Well, I'm not uh, privy to any of the actual agreements going on. So hearing what uh, Doreen and Amanda have said about this, I think this is really important. Uh, and it's very exciting to watch what's happening. And when you list, when you hear the list of things that are already happening, there's clearly a lot of activity in the United States. I think that it's important to stay on this. I think it's important, the work that you're doing on this panel right now, Lee, making sure that other folks are involved, that people are getting educated on this. This is gonna involve a lot of people and a lot of people are still learning about the industry and getting up to speed, trying to understand the order of magnitude. And again, I think that uh, when we look at the example from Denmark and we look at the examples from the States, what the public sector does and how the public sector works with the private sector matters a lot in terms of how the supply chain gets built out. So I would just encourage everyone to think that right now we're not functioning inside of a market. We are creating investments that are going to frame the market that is going to save the planet in the next 30 years. And we are early, early days. So right now, the things that are being done right now are our seeds that are being planted that are going to mean a lot. So I'm very encouraged by all the work that's going on, uh, and uh, we're really excited. Doreen, we're particularly excited about the leadership in New York and how you all have approached this, and we're wishing you well. Uh, Haley, did you have any uh, comments or questions you wanted to direct to uh, Amanda or Doreen? Yeah, I mean, also just to echo basically what Eric was saying, I'm very heartened and encouraged um, to hear of the strong commitment both from the federal government and the state government to a strong commitment to, you know, building out, I think what Amanda's called the pipeline, you know, covering really the whole supply chain and understanding the opportunity that we have here. And I also really think it's great that we're thinking about this all connected, right? When I was talking about the win, 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 for jobs, for climate, for workers, for union jobs, it really is all connected, right? And obviously, you know, speaking from a union perspective, I will always say uh, we have to prioritize good union jobs. But what I mean by that is, you know, we know these jobs lift up wages for all workers, right? We have an opportunity to create many jobs. Let's think creatively. Let's do it right and have the highest standards possible as we are, as Eric said, planting the seeds and setting standards, right? We have an opportunity to do it right. And I think um, thinking in the direction of buy American, buy New York, and to the extent that we can uh, buy union, I think is really the way to go. So I'm very encouraged. And this is not really a topic uh, where a lot of hope comes around, uh, especially these days as we're being, you know, hammered by one catastrophe after another. And obviously we have no time to lose. So I think we're really on a right track uh, to doing it right. And uh, just, you know, really wanted to echo that the strong commitment um, that, you know, is, I'm hearing here on the panel is really, really encouraging for us. Okay. Um, one question I wanted to ask um, both Doreen and Amanda, if you think about economic development, Traditional economic development has always done a good job of developing ports and various uh, development of spaces, um, terminals, ports, things like that. They're easily understood as public works and public infrastructure. The, the question I have, though, is relates to where we start to go into new areas uh, related to transmission facilities, the uh, cabling, the turbines, uh, the foundations where traditionally that work has been done in a private sector context. And the issue is, does that, to capture the benefits of that private sector activity for a, a region, does that require a different strategy or is it really just a question of scale? That if we have a big enough program uh, we'll get those things. I'm sort of curious of what your thoughts are on that. Doreen. Sure. Yeah, I think many of the fundamentals are, are the same, but I also think that what drives supplier decision-making as to the localization of components 
is 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 also there's there's a lot of factors that have very little to do with with really what the what levers the public sector has pulled um and so by that i mean um a good example might be the exchange rates um it may just make rational sense to localize because of some benefit or detriment um or sorry de- some detriment of of manufacturing in other countries. It also may be the case that those investments most often are on the basis of the physical parameters that are present in, in a state or in a region. So, so I'm sure at some point in this panel, we'll talk about the fact that the East Coast uh, is, is a busy place. Um, it's very built up in a lot of ways. And fundamentally, we don't have the space that, that um, exists um, at some of these European ports to advance some of these investments. So I think it is the case that there is an optimization that occurs from a supplier's perspective that looks at the physical space the requirements placed on them by a jurisdiction, in my case, like New York's, but also aspects like workforce, um, labor rates, costs of, of uh, land, et cetera, that all really add up to the decisions that we see. You know, we can control the things that we can control <laughs> and uh, we can facilitate the outcomes we seek, but there are a lot of factors that really have to do with, with their own um, decision-making um, and preferences. Okay. And, um, you know, Doreen, I just, I, I just, that was so well said. Uh, I, I just want to add and say that, you know, to, to answer your question as well, Lee, about sort of how how we can see that happen or whether it will come, I, I do think that something that's going to be important down the line and really critical to the success of building out a supply chain is going to is going to need to be continued collaboration and partnerships across states uh, as well as uh, you know developers coming together. And I say that for two reasons. One is. Uh, as as important and as exciting as it, as it is to drive jobs, uh, and, and clearly this is this is a New York panel, so we'll use New York as the example. As the opportunities to build manufacturing capacity in New York, I think we also need to think about it regionally. What's what's the regional demand of these projects, and what are we going to need across the entire East Coast in order to support this development? We have Maine uh, represented here too, of course. You know, what, what do we need to service all the way from Maine down to North Carolina where we have active lease areas and ensure that there is a coordination uh, for these efforts so that we're, we're adequately building the supply chain where we need it to support all of these, uh, these projects across, across the East Coast. And, and then the other thing I'll note is just that, you know, there's, it, it's, it's a little bit of a, if you build it, they, they will come, uh, that's happening, I think, uh, in the context of supply chain, too. If you look at something like monopile facilities that are really expensive to ship, you know, building a monopile facility, it, you know, in the United States is going to put you at a really great advantage. Whoever whoever takes that first plunge, there are facilities that are being built now, uh, and, and having developers contract with those new facilities, you know, that it's, it's going to be a cost consideration for them. Uh, because it's going to be more attractive to be able to get that locally rather than paying the expense of shipping such a large component uh, that's going into this. Because ultimately, a lot of these components are really big. And right now, we don't have the manufacturing capability in the United States to make some of those bigger components. Uh, so so really, um, uh, creating this demand and having that collaboration and that regional approach, I think, is going to set us up really well, uh, ultimately, for for driving towards the supply chain investments that we need to see. Okay. Um, okay. Any other comments uh, from panel members? I would just piggyback on the fact that um, what Amanda was saying, it's a little naive to think that every state is going to get the, a turbine uh, factory. It's important for us, and we're talking about doing it in Maine, to do kind of a regional MOU. Um, as well as the employees' mobility. Um, it's great to be looking to Maine and say, we want all of our employees to come from Maine. We want them all trained in Maine. But in actuality, if they've already been trained and can come to Maine and train Maine employees here, 
there should be some mob- mobility of uh, employees as far as that's concerned. And then the developers and construction companies can feel a little bit more um, assertive about um, bidding on leases and going to areas knowing that they don't have to retrain an entire workforce when they get there. But I would like to just, if I could just piggyback from what Grant just said, that's a very important comment that he made because that was one of the questions that was asked um, you know, by the developers who have projects uh, in different areas along the East Coast. You know, uh, it's great to have project labor agreements, but but one of the, you know, with that comes the your traditional you know jurisdictional lines of of portability of your of your workforce, and um, you know. And that, that was one of their concerns, you know, where are these workers that were trained and had the experience on on one project going to be able to go down and work on another? And I think the answer to that is yes, for a couple of reasons. One, there are going to be those that, that really, uh, certainly in the building trades, that may not necessarily want to work in the atmosphere. So it's going to be, it's going to be a special type of, of, of person that, that worked on these projects. And I can say that those of those members of mine uh, that worked on Block Island, I mean, that was a, a tremendous experience for them, and they wish that the next project would have been on its heels. So I think the answer to the developers is this workforce will migrate uh, from one project to another, and I, th- I don't think it's, it's really necessarily going to be a problem. Okay. Just, just to add to what Dave's saying, um, when you're looking at getting a, a massive amount of uh, construction employees to different areas or needing a, a mass amount at once, uh, the the only really place you can look is to unions because you, we we have that capability. We, if you show up and you need a bunch of people for a project, you just let us know and we provide those people for the project. So it can give uh, developers uh, confidence that once they win in a, win in a lease area, that they'll be able to, uh, you know, complete the work. Okay. So, uh, Mariah, do we have uh, questions from um, the audience that uh, you would like to bring forward? Yes, we have plenty of questions from the audience, and a few of them are really focused on timelines. So for the first one, I'll start with what are the federal and regional approaches for a transmission build out to get offshore wind generation around the grid effectively and efficiently? Who will lead this coordination and what is the timeline? The transmission is a, a, sorry about that. I'm I'm gonna jump in uh, though. My other panelists, please please answer, but uh, Transmission is a critical piece of this. Uh, you know, we need to think about this from two different perspectives. One, we have to think about the offshore grid to ensure that we are looking for opportunities to minimize impacts and to have a, a smart offshore grid that um, really uh, seeks to avoid minimize uh, potential impacts. So, so we need to think about a, a smart offshore grid and uh, you know, certainly interconnection opportunities uh, onshore, um, as well as adequate transmission to bring this energy to our load centers is critical. So uh, BOEM is working with our federal partners, as well as states and others to, to look at uh, how we can approach this, uh, because I do think transmission is going to be a really important piece. And I think in some areas, we're better equipped to uh, ensure that we have adequate transmission interconnection uh, as well as a transmission backbone onshore. But I'll I'll let, I assume NYSERDA might want to comment on that. Uh, And offshore, you know, we're really seeking and looking for opportunities now about how we can, you know, really further uh, uh, optimize the the offshore opportunities to minimize those impacts as described. Uh, But I I know there's been some great work uh, that New York has done on transmission. So I'll let Doreen speak to that. Great. Great. Yes, certainly this is a topic we've been spending a good bit of time working on in the past couple of years. It is true that it's for a state like New York, it's not just an issue with respect to offshore wind. It's it's a statewide issue, which is to ask the question, um, will our grid uh, be sufficient, our existing grid be sufficient to 
to withstand and, and support the future that we know to be true, which will be a preponderance of wind, solar, hydro, and in our discussion, offshore wind, uh, serving our load in, from very different places than, than was the case when the grid was, was advanced many decades ago. And I think the good news is we've been spending a good bit of effort um, to advance transmission projects. This year alone, we have over 200 miles of transmission under construction. But we did take a look earlier this year really to look at this from the perspective of what it would need to look like in 2030 and in 2040 and issued a power grid study earlier this year consistent with that objective. And, And the long and short of it, is that there are what I would call dry side issues and wet side issues. The dry side issues relate to not only the points of interconnection, but the network on land. Um, we concluded that our state is, is in pretty good shape from this perspective with the exception of needs for inner ties between Long Island and New York City for this very reason, uh, to deliver this influx of offshore wind that we, we know is coming and is already happening. So we are currently advancing projects in the bulk side um, in that respect. From from the ocean side, though, it it really gets very interesting because it is true that we could all imagine huge benefits that would come potentially from, from an offshore grid. But the reality is the processes that we are all running are all moving (laughs) at a pace that frankly outpaces the planning process that would be necessary to advance you know of course a regional grid but but even a very significant grid in new york and so to that end the approach that we and and this is different depending on the state but the approach that we are advancing really i would categorize as as a mesh um, ready approach an approach that that certainly we've learned from Europe in considering, which would allow these projects that we are connecting via radial lines now to ultimately be interconnected to one another um, at a time and in a manner that can be uh, advanced in parallel with these very active procurement processes that we um, know that we want to continue with. So, So we've looked at it and we are planning to really incorporate these requirements to be ready for an offshore grid in the future. And it is also the case that we are looking at very significant challenges in and actually routing these cables into these points of interconnection. So we are also in parallel advancing some processes to more effectively permit these these uh, routes through New York Harbor, which is a particularly challenging place to, to bring um, these projects ashore. But frankly, it is, um, I don't want to send it back to Amanda. I won't, I promise. But it is the case where federal leadership from the broadest perspective is something that I think is is exciting to see, um, given the, the huge benefits that I imagine it would provide. Well, uh, you, you sent it back to Amanda uh, inadvertently, perhaps. But, um, and Amanda, we know you're, you're, you have a schedule uh, constraint, so I'm going to, offer you the last word for your portion of this so that you can m- move on to your the, the rest of your day. you have uh, some closing um, comments or remarks you'd like to share with us? Yeah, you know, well, well first, uh, you know, thank you. I really appreciated being here today. It was wonderful to, to be on this panel with some some uh, lovely uh, and really great thinkers in this space and, and really critical partners in the labor movement. Um, you know, I I, uh, I, I just want to close by, I suppose, uh, again, stating that offshore wind is a priority for the Biden-Harris administration. And there is no doubt that the offshore wind agenda that this administration has advanced is ambitious. It is incredibly ambitious, uh, but it's also realistical, realistic and achievable. And more so, it is absolutely necessary. Climate change poses an existential threat to all of us and all of the developments I've discussed today, combined with a growing nationwide interest in and demand for offshore wind energy, indicate that the country is well positioned to transition to a clean, renewable energy future. We know that offshore wind can help communities be a part of the climate solution by providing clean energy and job creation, particularly in underserved communities. 
but really these benefits can only be realized if we all come together to ensure that all potential development is considered and advanced responsibly. So as we move forward, we're going to continue to conduct a transparent process that incorporates extensive public and stakeholder engagement and results in responsible offshore wind development, which creates good paying union jobs, responsibly coexists with mul multiple ocean users, avoids or minimizes impacts to marine life and is informed by the best available science and knowledge. And we will continue to coordinate and collaborate with federal agencies, tribes, states, ocean users, union leaders, and offshore wind industry to achieve the realistic and workable clean energy development goals that we have set out as a nation. So thank you for having me here today. And I'm so sorry to have to hop off a bit early. Take care. Okay, thank you, thank you. Can I comment on the transition uh, piece there? Sure. I think it's important that we also look at some of these uh, existing infrastructures to use. Here in Maine, we have a facility at Cousins Island. It's an oil powered gas plant, about 600 megawatts, and um, only runs two or three months of the year. And, it, you know, love to close that place and use it as a landing point for offshore wind, as well as uh, the infrastructure exists where there was Maine Yankee, which was a nuclear facility that's since been closed now for over a decade. Um, I think that the Monroe, Morro Bay project Triton Winds has in California is also going to an existing closed uh, power plant. So if we have the infrastructure that's already there, if we just have to improve it a little bit to improve our grid for these first projects, I think that that's a, a good idea and a good way for the people that work. Um, so Cousins Island is a unionized workforce at that power plant. It would be a good transition for them to go into um, the O and M side of, of offshore wind as well. Interesting. Um, Mariah, you have other questions for us? I do indeed. Another question. What is a realistic time frame for tier three and four suppliers and manufacturers to get funded, trained, and production ready for entry into the offshore wind supply chain? Is that for Doreen? Yes, I guess it must be. What is tier three? Sorry, is that a question for me? The ask the participant did not say in particular who the question is for, um, but I think it's general for the panel. Would make sense for you, Doreen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, listen, I I wouldn't claim to be an expert on on you know, the specifics of these, um, these components. However, I will reiterate the point that what it has surprised me and as someone who's, who's been working on this for quite a long time is, is how quickly the, these sort of core investments are spreading into the, the supply chain in our state and, and the list that Amanda provided I've got to believe the same is true in those other investments as well. I mean, a great example here in here in the capital region in, in New York is the fact that we have made, as as is well known, an investment in the Port of Albany to advance tower and transition piece um, fabrication here in in Albany. And one thing that has surprised me in a very pleasant way is, is the fact that local companies are already being asked to provide not only work, you know, workforce support for that port, but also components that would um, begin to, to feed into that investment at the Port of Albany. So a good example might be secondary steel as a, as an investment that starts to make more sense to localize if you have a local investment in a fabrication facility as an example. And although there are not uh, major investments in this way that are, are publicly known um, from the perspective of the broad federal sense, it is the case that it just makes sense for these companies to make those types of investments for all the reasons we just described. So my bet is it is not a long time till these anchor investments begin to spread again through the other tiers of the supply chain. 
um, in the coming years as these ports notably become available, which is not immediate in some instances, but, but I hope that's useful. Yeah, Eric, you wanted to comment? Yeah, I'd like to chime in. I think in general, you know, the, the question really is about people with existing capabilities and assets in the United States. How do people climb into this industry? And I really want to echo what Grant was saying. The work that's going on up in Maine is extremely innovative, not only because of the floating concrete foundations, but because these are bridge builders that are now building offshore wind turbine foundations. And I want to draw the connection here between floating offshore wind in Maine and the kind of foundations that Equinor has been debating about in New York uh, called concrete gravity-based foundations. That's essentially the same technology. It may look different to the uneducated person, but both of these are concrete solutions that are built by the construction industry, which already exists, already has a high level of competence and capability in the United States. You don't have to import anything in order to get this going, okay? Then you tow them out, same way. You do not disturb the right whales with all the pounding of the monopiles. Uh, you do not need gigantic, you know, wind turbine installation vessels. There are all sorts of benefits to towing these foundations out. And then if you're up in Maine with Grant and his crew, you leave them floating and you, you know, you hang down some cables and tether them to the ground. And if you're in New York, you float them down the Hudson, you take them out into the wind energy area, and then you ballast them and sink them to the bottom. And then if you need to repair them, you take out the ballast and float them back into port. So this makes sense in all sorts of ways. A lot of people have sort of assumed that this is an unproven technology, but the Norwegians have been building concrete gravity-based foundations for oil and gas for over 50 years. These things can be built to last for over a century, okay? And they are a proven technology, and there's a lot of work already in Norway and in Spain and in the UK, and we have all the capabilities in the United States. So I just want to encourage people to think about how do we work with what we have as creatively as possible? And it's not just tier three, tier, tier four suppliers. This is also the big stuff. And just because when we think about investments, we think about investing in a factory. We think about investing in a quote unquote technology. But if we're building infrastructure, we ought to think about investing in building bridges, except they're not bridges now, they're offshore wind turbine foundations. And so that kind of contracting operates in a different kind of a market uh, than perhaps we're usually you know, used to thinking about in terms of spurring economic development. But I think the folks on this panel and the people in the industry understand that. And I think that the key word here is collaboration across the region between the states and the feds and knowing what is available to us. We've got to know what's available to us. And we really can't be frightened into thinking that there's no more innovation left. We're just beginning this. Uh, and, and the world is wide open in terms of what we can do in the United States. Yeah, very very well said, uh, Eric. And I think that uh, when people think of it in those terms, it also uh, puts into perspective the important role the government has to play uh, in developing uh, this, in, in this infrastructure. Uh, we, we only have a couple more minutes before we have to wrap up to make room for the Secretary of Labor. Um, Haleen, did you have any final comments that you would like to make? Yeah, again, you know, just echoing um, what folks have been saying that, um, well, what you were just saying about, um, you know, thinking creatively and I think the role that government can play, right, in this process is um, promoting both, right, having a domestic supply chain and, again, having a domestic supply chain with really high road union labor standards um, is an opportunity here that we shouldn't miss. And I think, um, you know, given that there's already such great commitment, um, not shying away from figuring out how to develop these capacities here um, because we have no other choice, right? Otherwise, you know, we're, we're kind of missing the boat here. Um, and I think, you know, the commitment on this panel by everyone is clear that we're really committed to building this green energy future here in America and ideally with um, high road, strong union labor standards. Yes, I think that's a goal that uh, everybody on the panel shares. Um, and so uh, with, with that, I think we, we need to wrap up. Um, 
We're coming in on uh, 314, which was uh, my, my assignment, get this uh, panel up and running and done by 314. I think we've had an excellent uh, discussion. It's exciting to think about how fast things are changing and that there's a lot underway. And the Biden administration is off to a great start. Um, and I think the challenge for us going forward is to think about how to expand their horizons so that over the next three or four years, we, we can see the offshore wind industry in the U.S. You know, really get established and take off. And you know, with New York at nine gigawatts, there's going to be other states that need to come in at you know at the same levels or more. And and we can really solve our problems. So. Uh, with that, I want to thank all the panelists for being involved today. Uh, thanks to uh, Mariah for uh, helping us out on the questions. And uh, we'll, we'll see you at the third annual summit next year.